Greetings, folks, and welcome to another episode of the Lessons from the Cockpit Show. This is episode number 76, and I'm really excited to have this particular guest on. On the Lessons from the Cockpit Show, we debrief some of the most intriguing and fascinating pilots, air crew members, maintainers, and aviation enthusiasts from all over the world. We want to hear their stories, but more importantly, what did they learn from these extreme and extraordinary military, commercial, and even general aviation events? The purpose of the show is to hear these stories and analyze these lessons so that we've got a better understanding of how does the aviation world work, but more importantly, increase critical thinking skills both in the air and on the ground. A lot of the stories that you're going to hear, folks, on the Lessons from the Cockpit show have never been told before, particularly where our vets are concerned. And so it gives them an opportunity to share their legacy, but more importantly, maybe do a little healing at the same time. This episode of the Lessons from the Cockpit show is brought to you by Wall Pilot, custom aviation art for the walls of your home, office, or hangar. These are four, six, and eight foot profiles of famous airplanes printed on vinyl that you can peel off and stick to any flat surface. And we do patches too. Wall Pilot can also do custom aviation profiles. Again, for the walls of your home office or hangar, we can give you your favorite airplane with your name, tail number, and even the weapons load that you want on the aircraft. And folks, these are exhaustively researched and extremely detailed. We even have the stenciling on the AIM-9 missiles with the arming T-handles. So go by wallpilot.com and look at some of the 140 ready to print or fill out a custom form and have us do you one to your specifications. Go by the website or the Facebook page for Wall Pilot and take a look at some of the pictures from our customers because these things really are amazing when you see them. On this episode, folks, we're going to talk to one of my very good friends. He read my book and then contacted me and we've become great friends ever since. And I recently spent a weekend with my wife and I in Boston and we're going to talk a little bit about that gala. So, Grab an adult beverage of your choice, sit down, strap in, and let's begin the Lessons of the Cockpit Show with my very good friend and very experienced pilot, T.C. Capaletti. Welcome to the Lessons from the Cockpit Show, and today we have Mr. T.C. Capaletti with us. How you doing this morning, T.C.? 10 feet tall and bulletproof sluggo, ready to rock and roll here on Lessons from the Cockpit. <laughs> TC and I go back a little ways, don't we? What? Well, you're far wiser and smarter than I, but yes. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> don't know about that, but I appreciate the words. Thank you. So, tell us who you are. Uh, well, sluggo... Uh, my journey started about 37 years ago professionally. I was a uh, Air Force RTC guy commissioned. I was a non-rated program manager before I was lucky enough to get selected to go to pilot training and win my wings at Willie by the Seashore, Chandler, Arizona, class 9112, the cool spot. <laughs> and uh, flew the mighty C-9 uh, for better part of nine years in the Air Force. At the same time, I went off and uh, found uh, employment as a civilian airline pilot. So I've been flying professionally since 1991, a little over 20,000 hours, about three or four type ratings, that and four bucks will get you a cup of coffee. But it's been an interesting journey. And uh, knowing that you've got your podcast, I thought I might be able to share a little bit with your audience. And you and I have talked about this before. So tell everybody what programs you manage, what a, what an Air Force program manager is and what kind of programs you are managing. An Air Force program manager, former 2724, now 63XX. <laughs> I was the developmental test manager for this beautiful airplane, call sign Opus, a Combat Talon II MC-130H. Uh, lieutenants should never be program managers, but I was. Uh, Area B, Wright-Patterson, 87 to 1990, and I helped manage the development of this uh, special ops uh, platform uh, at both E-Systems in Greenville, Edwards Air Force Base on the developmental test side, and in other locations we don't want to talk about today. But the Combat Talent is the world's premier infill, exfill, covert platform based on the C-130H model with a very functional TFTA radar in the nose, satellite communications, 
QRC-1402 jammers and an ALQ-172 defensive system. Um, so I did that for three years. That helped me to escape the gulag at Wright Patton and go to flight school. So I'm very grateful to uh, Denny Borsik for uh, cutting me loose. <laughs> All right, now tell them what the C9 is, because it's got a ah, really unique C9. mission. I, I don't have my C9 model with me. It's up on the shelf here. So if you give me a second, Slogo, I will go grab okay. it. Stand yeah. by. Go grab it. I'm back. Okay. This is the mighty C9 Nightingale, of which 24 were purpose-built by McDonnell Douglas between 1968 and 1971. And this is an airplane in MAC colors, as in Midnight Air Command or Military Airlift Command. Mm -hmm. I flew this very same Jet 583 for the mighty 73rd Squadron at Scott Air Force Base, the finest mm -hmm. flying squadron in the reserve, hands down by far any day of the week. This is not a coin check. Yeah. So the mighty C9 was a air medical evacuation platform purpose built and for the better part of 35 years provided the best care in the air to the entire department of defense, whether you're a civilian a dependent or a military member. And sadly, they're all in the Bowdoin yard, except for three ones at Dover, ones at Lackland and one is on a pogo stick at Scott air force base. Mm -hmm. uh, so what kind of passengers you, uh, you say aeromedical that? back passengers just tell the audience okay these are the kinds of people that we'd have on because i know there's a lot of different folks that would get on your plane so these could be patients whether ambulatory or in litters they could be military members serving members or their dependents or dod civilians so we would pick them up at one hospital and take them to another like we'll take them from andrews air force base malcolm grow to kelly air force base uh, i'm sorry lackland air force base mm -hmm. um to uh, Wilford Hall for 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 a center of excellence for better care, yeah. uh, whatever the need was, we would move patients from one part of the country to the other. Now there also were squadrons in Japan to cover PACAF, and one squadron at Rhein Main later Ramstein uh, to cover Usafi. That must have been a very interesting mission because obviously, as a pilot up front, you saw some of these passengers. Is there any particular mission that stands out in your mind from flying the C-9? Well, first of all, Slug, it was probably one of the most rewarding jobs in the Air right. Force. I, I got to be honest. Oh, you know, yeah. not all of us can pass gas in a tanker. OK. <laughs> However, one of the most personally rewarding jobs that I ever had as a pilot flying the C-9. The one, I guess, one mission that stands out in my mind is after Colbar Towers. They brought patients from Riyadh uh, back to the States to Charleston. And we went down to Charleston to pick up some of those uh, injured soldiers. And another day that stands out in my mind, I'll never forget, was the green ramp, green ramp accident at Pope. And we sent two airplanes down there when a airplane splattered itself all over the paratroop ramp at Pope. And that was a that was an ugly day. But in true C9 fashion, we put on our big boy, you know, pants and girl, big boy and big girl pants and went down to work. And the nice thing about C9 with the AirVac call sign is we had priority over everybody except for the president's airplane, pretty much, except for Air Force One or some yeah. of the reaches or some of the Venuses or some of the silver and ban uh, gold banner birds. Um, you use the AirVac call sign and you would go direct from Andrews Air Force Base to the outer market Kelly Air Force Base, and they would clear the lane for you. <laughs> yeah, and in yeah. pilot talk, that means you can go real fast and everybody gets out of the way. Everybody gets out of the way, exactly. Because <laughs> every air traffic controller knows who you are and what you're doing, don't they? That's actually in the pilot to controller glossary with that call sign. I did not know that. See what you learn, Sluggo, when you have TC on your podcast? <laughs> Well, and you're an incredible historian and read a lot and have met a lot of people too. And I'm sure we'll get into that as we, we talk some more. So so tell us about some of the other airplanes commercially that you've flown. Because you've flown cargo and passengers, correct? Yeah, I've flown 7.2s, 7.3s, 7.5s, 7.6s, 10.11s, DC-9s, MD-80s, uh, as well as the Air Force airplanes I flew. So I've... Uh, I've had a very road less traveled career, uh, but I'm uh, I'm very grateful that I got to do what I love for a living. And, you know, those of us 
we flew, we fly. Um, <laughs> that's the motto of the Dedalians. But I'm, I'm a proud member of Bal High Flight, yeah. former member of Willie Willy Flight. But um, I'm, I'm really grateful uh, that I've gotten to do for the past 30 plus years what I love to do. And whether it be commercial aviation or my Air Force career, it's opened so many windows to meet so many cool people like you, Mark, or guys like Nuke Tibbetts or, or other, you know, Drifter Toe, Shula yeah. Shinnick, uh, Blender Devotny, Don Dunlop, who I hope you get on your show. Uh, yeah. Just really the, the people you meet along the way is one of my lessons. Go right into that then. Relationships. Let's talk about it. Well, you asked me to come up with three things I've learned from sitting on a flight deck for 30 plus years. And one thing that I have taken to heart is relationships matter. Personally, professionally, I don't throw phone numbers or email addresses away. And the people you meet along the way in your journey are, are the most important things that you take with you as you age into middle age, like <laughs> you and me. <laughs> Whether it's Mr. Pilot by Mark Mascara. <laughs> Never Fly Solo by Waldo, my pilot training yeah. classmate at Willie. Yep. Shannon Polson, Grit Factor, phenomenal oh, Army aviator. Yeah, great book. Or I think here's a book that I think everybody should read, whatever you do for a living in the flying business. Tony Kern's Redefining Airmanship. Tony, Tony's really encapsulated some lessons that he's learned, former tanker pilot. That that I think everybody can. There's a takeaway in this book for everybody. I, this I don't sell books for Tony, but this is an amazing book. So go get it, read it, read it ten years later, you'll have a different perspective. But you know the, the one thing that you know about me, Mark, is I love history, and I've got my collection of signed books back there from Gunther Rahl and Paul Tibbetts the second. Uh and Sluggo, and Waldo, and Vic Viscara, and, you know, some really luminaries of the of the aviation business, civilian and military. I got a signed book by Eddie Rickenbacker up there. Not only uh, an ace in World War I, but a CEO of an airline later in his professional career. So relationships, people you meet along the way, you share a flight deck with. Later in life, you're not flying anymore. You're doing a different job. Those relationships still are important. Uh, the, the members of my pilot training class, we've had a 25th, we've had a 30th, only because I organized them. But, you know, they're, they're still my go-to friends. Uh, my buddies from my C9 squadron that I flew with for nine years, still, still very good friends. And I think that's, that's one very important lesson that people in our industry can learn. And, and that lesson morphs as you get older. Now I'm looking back because I've got less years in front of me than behind me. So I look back to the, to the people I flew with and the lessons I learned. Good, bad, ugly. But still, there's lessons that you learn that the old, the old joke is you got a helmet bag that's empty when you're a lieutenant and you put tricks in it over time. Well, the same, in, same thing in the airline business. You're a young FO or a flight engineer at some point in your career and you Learn things. You put them in your flight bag. Sooner or later, you will start taking those tricks out. One dark night when it's stormy and your fuel system doesn't work or electrical generator drops offline or whatever. Man, isn't that the truth? You know, you know that. Many, I know how that. Many, how many times have we gone to that bag and go, oh, here we go. I got well, this. My bag's almost empty, Sluggo, because I've used up a lot of tricks. But, <laughs> but. We've used uh, up a lot of lives, haven't we? Uh, I've used about 10 of my nine lives, Mark. <laughs> so that's, I think that's one of the biggest things that, that, they, that your audience can take away. Whatever, whatever age you are, whatever industry you're in, whatever you're flying, whatever you're doing, if you're a lieutenant right out of pilot training or you're a brand new FO at Delta Airlines, they're, they're, keep learning. Yeah. Keep building that network. Hey, I want, I want you to tell the audience about one relationship that you have. Tell us about your Navy SEAL buddy that we've been doing stuff for. You gonna make me cry, Sluggo? <laughs> <laughs> um, very special relationship. My college classmate, commissioning classmate, 1987, uh, Lieutenant John P. Connors, United States Navy, Team Four, Buds 148. 
for the past four years, a dedicated group of us have been working very diligently to put up a statue of John in his hometown of uh, Citroen, Massachusetts. And Mark, you've been part of that journey. You came to our gala last June. Oh, but it's incredible. That was an incredible night. It, it really was. But more importantly, that's a relationship that goes back a long time. Uh, John was killed in action in 1989, so that's 34 years ago. But to this day, the lessons he taught the rest of us about being a scholar, an athlete, a leader, they still resonate. And that's why 10 of us every other Friday have a Zoom meeting. That's why we commissioned a sculptor to fashion a phenomenal statue of John. And God willing, later this year, early next year, we will dedicate a statue on the town common in Situate, Massachusetts to my classmate. And, and I think that's another lesson that is often lost on modern day society is there's, there's a lot in, there's a lot we can do to serve a higher calling. And I think a lot of us who in our formative years wore a uniform understand that, but you don't have to wear a uniform to serve. You can serve your community, your school, your alma mater, your church, your synagogue, your Elks Lodge, your um, whatever it is. So, tell the audience what John was involved with, what happened, because it's John it's, was, a, it's a phenomenal story, folks. Operation At Just Cause, December nineteen eighty nine. Um, we went down south to depose a tin horn dictator in Panama, and uh, John's SEAL team was charged with securing uh, Patia Airfield, where uh, Noriega uh, kept the Learjet. And let's just say the op did not go as planned. And four SEALs were killed in action, including John. Uh, so if anybody wants to learn about it, go to our website, amessureofaman.org. And Mark's going to have that in his show notes. I will. And folks, you can obviously contribute to this uh, this worthy cause. And that's why I brought it up. That's why I brought it up. And, and, uh, I appreciate it, Mark. <clears throat> yeah. So you mentioned this gala that we had last uh, last summer. Why don't you talk about that just a little bit? Because that was an incredible night that uh, well, Val and I got to go to, and and uh, I got to bring my buddy uh, Mike uh, Ryder and his wife Sue. Uh, just an incredibly fun night. Talk about that for just a little bit. So the standing joke is two A model tanker pilots walk into a bar. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Mark. That you know. You were party to a wonderful evening, uh, you know, where we, A, celebrated John, and B, looked forward to dedicating the statue. We have the one-third maquette that Chas Fagan has uh, created that he will scale up to an eight-foot bronze statue. But more importantly, we had 250 people who came there to honor a guy who's been dead for 34 years. Yeah. And, 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 and the fact that his mom at age 89 was there, his brother, his two sisters, at least 15 Navy SEALs from different uh, eras uh -huh. uh, and then bob beeler uh -huh. uh, who retired as a two-star air force guy and a four-star uh, civilian equivalent yourself mr Ryder, some of my classmates from wpi a lot of holy cross and rtc guys including the current assistant commandant of the marine corps uh -huh. general chris mahoney call sign mo big uh -huh. shout out to mo for joining us in boston but we were next to the constitution in a tent on a windy rainy saturday night to honor a navy seal and the fact that 15 of his teammates would show up, four of them who fought with John in Panama in 1989, tells me that there's still a story to tell. And, uh, you know, we call it a measure of a man. That's our website. Uh, fashioned after a Reader's Digest article in 1990 called Measure of a Man by Malcolm McConnell. But to, to this day, those lessons resonate. And, as, uh, you know, the fire still burns. And... You know, honoring a classmate honors everybody who served this great nation since 1775. Particularly somebody that gave the last full measure of their devotion to their Indeed. country. Indeed. To their country. So you mentioned a lot of airplanes that you have flown, okay? Uh, I want to go through a few of those just real quick, okay? Uh, 727. What was that like flying in a 727? Because there's seven. Think about that, TC. I thought about this. There are probably listeners or their children who have no idea what a 727 is. Model. <laughs> of course. This is the mighty 727 200. 
in the colors of Express One Airlines. Uh, beautiful airplanes, first built and certified in 1963. Two pilots and a flight engineer. Yes, a flight engineer. So I'll go, you had a flight engineer on the tanker. However, modern airliners, no flight engineers left, unless you fly up in Alaska on a DC-6. <laughs> True, your statement. So this is a 7-2. Uh, I flew two out of three seats, engineer and first officer. Didn't make it to the captain's seat for the trifecta. Uh -huh. And I've not heard of that airline. What? Uh, where were you based out of? What, you know, what did you... Uh, Express went out of contract with the post office in Indianapolis, call sign Longhorn, oh. uh, calling uh, the mail back in the day when uh, uh, Emory had a global contract in the U.S. and then mm -hmm. three or four yeah. carriers did the work out of Indies, hub and spoke to different parts of the country, San Juan, Boston, Seattle, parts south, parts west, you know, pretty much the whole yeah. CONUS. But yeah, uh, part 121 non-sked. No scheduled airline, not like, you know, Delta, United, American, mm -hmm. DWA, Eastern, Pan Am. Yeah, I'm going back in the history books. Yeah, so mostly passengers or mostly cargo? I flew passengers on the DC-9 in Atlantic uh -huh. City, and then I flew mail on the 727. Okay, got it. So hopefully your your audience has now learned what a 727 yeah. yeah, because they've retired how long ago? Um, there's some still out there, onesies, twosies, but no, no air carriers use them. Uh, there's still yeah. some cargo airlines that have a couple, but they're yeah. pretty few and far between. Okay, pretty much interesting. And then you mentioned L1011s, Lockheed L1011s. Uh, so you've gone from 727s, you went to a a big airplane, a wide body airplane. Yes, sir. <laughs> Which airline were you flying with that? Model time, <laughs> of course. I was lucky enough, Mark, to be a flight engineer on this beautiful airplane. For that for TWA, airline? TWA. Oh, yeah. The Lindbergh Line, Transworld Airline. Yeah. Charlie Lindbergh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There you go. Uh, Where are you based out of? Uh, JFK. Okay. Beautiful Idlewild before yeah. it was called JFK. Fantastic yeah. airplane. Uh, 1973 Cat 3 airplane. Uh, Mach 90 capable. She would she would cruise at 90. You pour the coals to it. Wow, I didn't know that. For your re for your listeners, that's nine tenths of the speed of sound. So you're you're booking across the ground. You're you're moving. Okay. Uh, it, yeah. If uh, if uh, you would wheel out of Los Angeles, headed for Boston, pour the coals to it, you'd be there in about four and a half hours, maybe five. I did not know that. There is one left flying in the world. She's owned by Northrop Grumman called the Stargazer, former orbital ATK bird. I had the distinct pleasure of sitting in her about three years ago. It was like it was like getting in your first car. It was wonderful. Was it? Yeah. That must have been hobby. fascinating. Yeah. yeah, it really was. So did you fly uh, mostly U.S. routes or did, or, or did you go overseas a lot? Nope. Uh, by I the time I got to TWA in the 1011, it was all domestic. San Juan and San Domingo but and Hawaii, but that's pretty much. So Okay. So tell everybody how much fuel that thing holds, because it, it had some it had some legs on it. A lot. <laughs> uh, <laughs> TWA had three versions, the Dash 1, the Dash 50, and the Dash 100. The Dash 100 was a heavyweight uh, international bird. Uh, E-Tops Cape, well, not E-Tops, because it has three engines, but... Uh -huh. um, Honestly, Mark, that's so long ago. I don't remember how much fuel they were <laughs> It had three worry, fuel but... tanks. I remember that. Yeah. That information is perishable, Mark. <laughs> yes, it is, isn't it? Explain to uh, listeners Cat 3, what a Cat 3 approach is, because uh, this is some pretty incredible mins that you can take this thing down to. Cat 3 is a low visibility approach. So at 200 feet, you're a Cat 1. When the clouds are 200 feet above the runway, it's called a Cat 1 approach. You can see the runway at 200 feet, you land. Cat 2, you can get out about 50 feet with a radio altimeter. That's an instrument in an airplane. I don't have one of those in my den. Sorry, Sluggo. Mm -hmm. um, cat 3, 600 feet. If you, can, you don't even have to see the runway. If you have 600 feet of visibility, you see the lead-in lights, you will land. You are not flying the airplane. It is flown on autopilot. The L-1011 flew on autopilot, three autopilots, three IRSs in triple mix, Cat 3, 1973. Beautiful airplane. 
TC, have you ever had to do a CAT-3 approach? Yes, I have, Mark. Uh, the Air Planet Current flies CAT-3 capable, the Boeing 737 uh, flew CAT-3s in the, in the 5.7 and 6.7. So you're, you're, the autopilot is landing the airplane. Mm -hmm. The auto brakes are stopping the airplane. After you're done with the auto brakes, you taxi off the airplane. Uh, uh, runway, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, you you, know, you your hands are di well, your hands are you, yeah you, you're just kind of <laughs> hovering around the in case something goes wrong you are I, your hands that. near the yoke but you're not flying the autopilot is flying so tell everybody tc is there a particular cat three approach that you did where you're like going oh i'll remember this one mm. well there's only cat threes in certain airports salt lake denver atlanta dallas jfk boston C seattle portland la mm -hmm. san francisco you know big uh, cities phoenix not uh you know riverton wyoming <laughs> okay just to pick pick a random airport uh one that i remember mark you don't do a lot of them you train to them every year you yeah. have to recertify every year in the simulator yeah. But I've probably only flown about a half a dozen, no kidding, Cat 3 weather approaches, and mostly to Salt Lake and Denver. Those are the two places you get fog or snow, uh, yeah. or the Bay Area. Um, Seattle, once in a while, but I'd say a pre predominant or number of them were at Salt Lake or, or Denver. Interesting, since I'm on the approach path to Salt Lake City here. Now, obviously the airplane has to be certified, but so does the airfield. Talk about what the airfield has to be certified to do CAT-3 and the type of instrumentation and lighting they have to have. I'm, I'm going to preface three. this by saying I don't work for the FAA, but no, but but the, but the ground equipment has to be certified and checked and flight checked. Mm -hmm. The airplane has to be certified and the pilots have to be certified. So you've got three levels of certification. The ground equipment, you know, you've got an ILS, but the ILS has to be precise enough to fly an approach to 600 or 700 feet RVR, runway visual range. There's three things called transmissometers on a runway, rollout, midpoint, and uh, approach end. So those transmissometers feed you the RVR. If you have RVR greater than 600, equal to, greater than equal to, you can land. Less than 600? No landing. No, you can't. You land. go somewhere you else. Yeah, you go missed approach, and you go wherever your alternate is. And see, that's one thing. And all of my years of flying, particularly on the airlines when I'm going somewhere, TC, I've only been on a divert once. Isn't that that's crazy. Good. That's good. Yeah, it was going into believe it or not, Cedar Rapids, because one of those monster thunderstorms. Okay, was going over the top of Cedar Rapids. We couldn't land. We landed in uh, Moline. Moline, Moline. Yeah. Quad <clears throat> cities. Yeah. And the crazy thing was, the pilots told us, look, folks, this storm is moving west to east. So when we land at Moline, I'm going to let you guys get off the airplane, and you're going to see an incredible storm. Because he was telling me when I was talking to him, I saw this thing on the radar and it was a monster. Okay. There is nothing like a summer thunderstorm in the Midwest. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Watching that gray green wall coming from the West across Moline, you know, and as flyers, you and I ex know exactly what that gray green wall looks like, you know, and all the passengers are going, Oh, wow, look at that. The storm's coming. Well, it's like a haboob Ooh. out in the desert, or whatever they call it, the big sandstorm. You see yeah. the wall of sand coming, you go, uh oh, uh oh, uh oh, Batting down the hatches. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's uh oh. You know what? There was one other time I we had to divert. That was going to Russia's wedding. We had to divert to Fort Myers because of uh, weather over uh, West Palm Beach. So twice, twice. It doesn't happen an awful lot, Mark. I mean, you know, a flying is safe. It is mm -hmm. way safer driving than driving down I-25 here in Denver. B, we plan. We plan based on the weather, the field we're going to, where the alternate is. There, there is a plan, and we just execute the plan. Yeah, exactly. So talk to the audience. You are now flying 
737 800s and 900s that have incredible cockpit displays versus what you started with okay oh, yes back in the day they were called steam gauges <laughs> and we've graduated from steam gauges to EFIS, basically uh, electronic screens it's like playing a big video game and the max despite what you read and hear about mm -hmm. has some amazing displays now the 7.8 and the 350 have more amazing screens because they're bigger and it's a wide body and they're more modern but mm -hmm. yeah the the transition but for us um middle-aged aviators from the steam gauge era to EFIS. You know, it can be a challenge, but, you know, now every all the information is presented in such a manner where it's very easy to assimilate and read and act on. It's made flying so much easier, better, safer. You yeah. know, in this country, we have the safest aviation system, despite what you read, see on yeah. CNN. It, it, it really is. It's, it's, it's an amazing testament to the people that came before me that built the system like the Tony Kearns of the world. You know, like, and even the FA and the NTSB, you know, we work in concert as a community. And I used to work at Rockwell Collins. I got to see some of those displays and it's amazing. Yeah. But the heads up guidance system, man, the HUD, oh my gosh. Well, the, and the HUD, the HUD that, that uh, you know, you look through uh, presents all the information you see down in the EFA screen. So the HUD is a, another level. It projects all the information so you don't have to look down. You can look through the HUD, basically a clear piece of combiner glass through your window out to the outside world. And you can fly the airplane looking through the HUD. You know, civilian airliners have HUDs. C-17s have dual HUDs. Yeah. Uh, fighters, of course, have HUDs. Yeah. Uh, you know, heads up display, meaning your head is up. You are looking through the glass into the outside world, whether you're doing BFM in a in a viper an eagle or a raptor or a, uh, whatever they call an f-35 um or you're flying a civilian airliner to a cat 3 approach that's really what it's there for to lower your minimums and provide you more situational awareness what we call sa yeah uh the, and some of the equipment that i saw when i was working at it's now collins aerospace you had the heads up guidance system you had uh what was it called synthetic vision Mm -hmm. where you had all the terrain on the map on the on the display in front of you and then you had also the uh, the system that allows you to look down through all the muck okay what was it called enhanced vision oh my gosh yeah you got synthetic vision enhanced vision only the bizjet guys have that stuff the bombardier the the, the global expresses yeah. gulf streams civilian airliners have really not adopted uh, the synthetic vision or EVS mm -hmm. uh, technology as much as the bizjet world, to be honest. I did not know that. So you guys yeah. don't have EVS and stuff? Uh, like there are some airliners with synthetic vision and EVS, yeah. but predominantly not. Uh, you'll see that on Gulf Streams, yeah. Bombardiers, Falcons, you know, the BizJet world. That maybe we need to explain what EVS is, enhanced vision system. Tell everybody what that is, just real quick. It's a it's a synthetic aperture radar that presents a a view of the world onto a combiner glass on a HUD or an EFIS display. So what the radar sees, you see, but it you may be in the weather. Yeah. It can be used for ter terrain avoidance, mm -hmm. and it can also be used for weather avoidance, like you're flying through clouds. Okay. It's presenting. It's more information. It's this this SA thing we're talking about provides yeah. you higher level of SA. That's all. Yeah, and SA is good, Mark. SA is very good. We had a simulator. I flew into um, Jackson Hole, Wyoming, in a in a snowstorm. Yeah, and my gosh, I you know I was able to get right to the runway because all that information was right there on the heads up display, and of course on the on the displays out in front of me. I mean, it was. And and you and I started with electromechanical ADIs and you know all that kind Flying of stuff. Flying VOR outbounds, VOR <laughs> inbounds. Yeah. Litton ninety two IRSs, no GPS. In your world, you had a navigator doing the cell shots. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, just like Magellan. I'm think, going I mean, all think of think think of where 
think of where the aviation industry, military civilian, has come from the late 80s to 2024. It, it really has been a paradigm shift uh, for all you buzzword people out there um, about how technology has changed how we do our job. It really has, hasn't it, TC? Because, but but you mentioned too, it's made it so much safer. So Incredible. much safer. So much safer. I mean, the, the flying public needs to know that it is, it is so safe to get on an airliner today and go from point A to point B as compared to 1960, 1970, 1980, 1990, the aughts. We, we have yeah. an amazingly safe aerospace system in this country and worldwide. I mean, you can fly all over the world. You get on an airplane in Salt Lake City and you can be in Paris in nine and a half hours. Yeah. And then if you want to go to Dubai or Riyadh, you get on another airplane. And go a lot longer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. So, hey, that's a, a good question. Okay. Because, like, the 777 ERs, my son flew one from LA to Christchurch, New Zealand. That's a long time to be in an airplane. About 14 hours. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, talk about how a, a pilot crew manages that kind of a flight because. Obviously, there are more air crew members on board on some of these longer flights like this. Well, just like Sluggo, if you had a longer mission, you take an augmented crew. You take an extra pair of pilots, and somebody would get to rest every two hours. Subject to aircraft commander's discretion. <laughs> um, however, in the civilian airliner world, anything over, let's just say, eight hours, you need a third pilot. It's called a relief pilot. So triple seven, A three fifty, seven eighty seven, LA to Christchurch. Yeah. You're gonna have four pilots. You're gonna because over twelve hours, you're gonna have a double crew. So you're gonna have two pilots. They're all four gonna be in the flight deck at takeoff. Then two are gonna go back and rest in a dedicated rest area upstairs, out of view of the flying public, and then they'll trade off every two to three hours to manage their rest right. all the way to Christchurch. So everybody's bright eyed and bushy tailed flying yeah. into Christchurch yeah. at whatever time of day it is. And see, TC, I think a lot of people, a lot of people don't understand the physical and mental, I don't, I don't want to call it stress, but, but, uh, creating rhythms, fatigue that yeah. sometimes just causes because a lot of these guys are flying guys and gals, excuse me, excuse me. A lot of these guys and gals are leaving at like eight o'clock at night and flying through the night and landing in Dubai, you know, at like 10 o'clock in the morning, sun's up, you know, and everything that happens in between managing the fuel systems, making position reports, you really, really have to be mentally in the game and I remember coming home from long flights and I'd be home at like one o'clock in the morning and I couldn't get to sleep till like three o'clock in the morning because my mind is still racing. I'm sure that there's a term for that. I don't know what it is, but. Uh, well, yeah. So, so the way you manage that is a combination of things. Rest, mm -hmm. how you plan your rest prior to flying, during yeah. flying, after flying, diet, mm -hmm. exercise, yeah. all those things feed into a well-rested crew and whatever airplane you're in. I mean, whether it's a tanker or a C-17, mm -hmm. a C-141, yes, I'm dating myself, uh, <laughs> 777, 78, A350, uh, you know, A330. What, yeah. Long haul flying is very different than short haul flying. I mean, I get tired between Seattle and Portland, and that's a 45-minute flight. <laughs> but, but, but if you're flying, let's say you're flying New York to Johannesburg, okay? That's yeah, a long that's way a to long go. Flight. You have to manage your diet, your rest, your caffeine intake, your your attention level. I mean, we yeah. all have circadian rhythms. Yeah. You don't want to be all together when everybody's circadian rhythm bottoms out. Bad yeah, things happen. Bad things happen. Yeah, like a um, airplane stalls over the mid-Atlantic because the pedo system is feeding erroneous information. And the two pilots on the flight deck are not interpreting that information correctly, and the airplane goes into the Atlantic. Bad day at the office. Was that the Sao Paulo to Paris trip? Air France. Yeah. 
and they were dealing with some really nasty weather at the same time too, weren't they? Weather had nothing to do with it. They stalled the airplane at 35,000 feet. Really? Yep. They were getting bad pedo information. Third pilot was uh, taking a break. Two pilots mm -hmm. pulled back on the stick till it stalled. Literally deep stalled, 35,000 feet went into the drink. Oh, jeez. That's that S8 thing I was talking about. So we'll, br we'll bring it back full circle. Yeah. Where are you? What you doing? And what should you be doing? Blue side up, brown side down. Yeah, yeah. You know, trees get smaller, yeah. trees get bigger. <laughs> you know, ba yeah. no, back to aviate, navigate, navigate and, and communicate. communicate. Mark, back to your three maxims. And isn't that incredible, TC? Every pilot, every air crew member knows those three words. Tony talks about it. Does he? Yeah. I've got to go Don't. out and get that book. Because, <clears throat> I mean, when I was going through pilot training, that was one of the first things that we were being taught. Find a sign. Thank you. <laughs> I'm a signed book junkie, Mark. You know that. Uh, yeah, he is. And, and folks, he's got a lot of signed books. He's got an incredible library. But again, it's the same thing. Everybody, I, I, I went and talked to a, a young kid who's a private license carrier guy, you know, flying Cessnas. And I looked at him, I said, aviate. And he goes, navigate, communicate. Even the same, he same maxims, Mark, since Orville and Wilbur got mm -hmm. in the right B flyer. No yeah. kidding. I, I mean, to today, the, the, the maxim are the same. If you aviate, then navigate, then communicate, you will RTB. Yes. Turn to bait. Yes, you will. Okay. And that's ingrained in our heads and, and we go out and we do it. Okay. It we've had you and I both have had some pretty incredible emergencies where we went, okay, calm down, aviate, navigate, communicate. Mark, navigate, navigate, I am navigate. lucky. I've never lost an engine or had a major malfunction. My wood in my tanker didn't start burning because of a bleed air duct leak. Okay. No, I'm, <laughs> I am very, I am very lucky. Okay. Very grateful. Yeah. And when I shut the engines down for the last time in five years, 10 months and two days, I will be hopefully as lucky. Yeah. See, and that's amazing TC because you know, you're flying on an airplane that has incredible engines. The CFM 56 engines are just amazing. Engines. And now the leap engines on the max are 23% more fuel efficient with more thrust and, and more reliable. So tell everybody why that is and, and explain what leap, you know, what the leap engines have done for the aviation, uh, particularly the airline world. And you'd have to ask the folks at G and SNECMA. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm a mechanical engineer. However, they're beautiful engines. They're, they're higher bypass. They burn less fuel. They're more eco friendly. They put out less emissions yeah. for the same amount of gas. And so that's, quieter. that's, they're quieter, you know, all the above. As engine technology improves, the GE 90X, highest highest thrust rated motor in the civilian world at 125,000 pounds of static thrust per motor. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, baby. She's kicking it. But, you know, whether it's that or the Trent or the RB211 modern yeah. versions or the Leap, engine technology, because yeah. of metallurgy and, and computer control, they're not electromechanical, electromechanical controls yeah. anymore. They're all electronic. They have a, a brain in the engine that meters the fuel way better than I can with my throttles. Way better. So, yeah. pop, you know, gallon for gallon, uh, an NG yeah. versus a Max 737 at cruise, way more efficient with the Maxes driving the uh, Leap 1 Bravos. And see, you and I started with what, J57s? And, and so what are the three useless things in aviation, Mark? Gas in the truck, altitude, altitude above, above you, me, and, and runway, runway behind, behind me. So that first thing, gas in the truck. You're, if I carry the same gas load and I go further, I'm more efficient. Yeah, exactly. And that's that's why the CFM 56 engines on the KC-135 literally paid for themselves. Except for no thrust reverser. <laughs> You know what, TC? I know that story. I know you do. That's why I brought I, it up. I know that story, okay? <clears throat> Just real quick. I was in Guam, and a GE engine engineer was on my tanker because he was going to Kadena. And I asked him, you know, I said, who are you? You're civilian, you know, but uh, I don't normally see civilians on uh, the tanker. And he goes, 
oh, I'm with GE and this is how we move around and everything like that. I'm former, he was former military, okay. <clears throat> and so instead of getting on an airliner, he just got on military jets and would go across, okay. Save a little bit of money. And he said, yeah, I love being around all the military folks. And I asked him, I said, so, you know, what kind of a GE engineer are you? And he says, oh, CFM 56s. And I go, why? 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 Yeah. Okay. Question time. Why in the world did we take the thrust reversers off? And he goes, dude, you need to talk to Strategic Air Command about that because that was a decision they made. He said, uh, for, for your listeners, Mark, prior to a certain day and time, there was a thing called SAC run by a general named LeMay or yeah. John Chain or yeah. a, a long string of phenomenal warriors, yeah. which became Air Combat Command when the bomber and the tanker and communities merged. George Kinney. That's some Sack. incredible guys. Strategic Amazing Air people. Command. Yeah. Strategic Air Command. And great and, movie too with Jimmy Stewart. Yeah, it is a great movie. It is a great movie. <laughs> and and I asked him flat out, I go, why? And he goes, Strategic Air Command requirement. I said, why? What do you mean? He said, they knew the tanker crews hadn't used them, and so they weren't going to put them on. I'm like, well, all the E-models have thrust reverse. And he goes, sorry, Captain, we made all of these things. We said all these things in front of them, and they just said, no. Nope, uh -uh. The other thing was is moving the uh, main engine control uh, out from underneath the bottom of the engines because of pod scrapes. And uh, yeah. he told me the price of of the engine with thrust reverse and the MEC on the bottom versus the sack price, you know, and I was shocked, you know, yeah. but he was right. Well, but that's, but that's the evolution of the industry. I mean, yeah. thrust reversers are not counted in your takeoff and landing data. Honestly. No, they're not. They were Benny. They're, they're a Benny. The brakes are, and you know, the, the auto brakes yeah. versus yeah. thrust reverse. Thrust reverse is not counted by Boeing, Airbus, Lockheed, Northrop Grumman, General Dynamics, whatever company's making airplanes, Bombardier, Dassault, not figured in your takeoff and landing data. And he told me this is how they made up for it. They put five rotor brakes on the arm models. There you go. Instead of four rotor brakes. Well, the Maxes have carbon fiber brakes now, and they're they 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 they're much more efficient, much more. Yeah, because there's been a couple of times where I've landed with hot brakes. I, I've landed heavy. You just go out to a holding pad and they <clears> put a <throat> fan on your hot brake. Yeah, exactly. And, and that's exactly what they Because you melt the fuse plugs. Yeah, <laughs> and that's exactly what we did. Uh, you know, yeah. I remember one instance I landed heavy, okay, in an R model, okay. And, uh, you know, we said, okay, five rotor brakes. And we looked at all the data and everything in the book and everything in the performance data and everything. You okay. mean the flight engineer looked at all the data in the book? No, uh -uh, because you got to remember, uh, we didn't have a flight engineer. We had two pilots, a nav, and a boom. We didn't Never have went. a flight engineer. Yeah. I retract that statement. Yeah. <laughs> the KC-10 has a flight engineer, but the 135 didn't. And and, and, and honestly, since you brought it up to Gucci, yeah. uh, this month, they've started to fly the Gucci's to the boneyard at davis I know. My jury is still not out on that, brother. I'm You're the tanker worried. subject matter expert. I'm just an airlifter with a mini Mac patch. I'm uh, I'm <laughs> I'm worried about our ability to uh, move things. But that's for another discussion some other time. That's for another podcast, Mark. Yeah, that's for another podcast, okay? But yeah, he told me, he goes, your leadership is the one that did this to you. And they made up for it by putting five rotor brakes on the thing. And and like I said, the only time I ever had hot brakes was, of course, flying into Kadena because we just got in the R models and I landed heavy one day and had the crew chief go down and he goes, yeah, they're warm. I said, okay, well, let's just sit here for a while, turn into the wind, you know, and, uh, you know, and we even had a performance sheet that said, okay, if you landed at this weight, that means they're this hot. You have to wait this long at the end of the runway. And there was actually procedures point into the wind or have somebody come out with fans and depending on how heavy you were. Sure. But, and, uh, and so many airlines have similar charts do uh, they? Break, break, called break energy charts. Yeah. Yeah. You know, your gross weight, you know, the pressure altitude of the airfield, yeah. you know how much energy you've put into those brakes, mm -hmm. how much energy you need to dissipate. Yeah. Because energy can't be created or destroyed, right? Yeah. You have to convert yeah. it from potential to kinetic. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's one of those yeah. things. Let's leave it to the pointy nose physics majors. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You know, and 
And I used to joke with my uh, boss when I was a systems engineering manager at Rockwell. I've gone as far in engineering as my political science degree will allow, you know, and she just laughed at me. But I had all this experience in all these different airplanes like you did, you know, and that that made for a that made up for a lot of the engineering stuff that. Uh, it, I didn't you know, know, honestly, some of the best pilots are history majors. You know, you don't have to be an engineer to be a pilot. And, I, and that's and that's true, yeah. you know, because because like we talked about earlier, where you're learning these tricks, put them in your bag. Yeah. One day you take the trick out. Doesn't uh, nobody cares what kind of sheepskin you got on the wall? Mm -mm. Is it can you aviate, navigate? navigate yeah. Honestly, that's if you learn those three things in your formative training, they will serve you well for the rest of your career. And they'll probably save your life at some point in time. Uh, they have saved many. Um many. Mr. Sullenberger, Captain Chesley Sullenberger being the uh best example of that with his amazing first officer, Jeff Sykes. Yeah. Amazing. The, on that day, their essay was high and yeah. they performed flawlessly. Yeah. You can't ask, you can't ask any better example of aviate, navigate, communicate. He no. just happened to navigate to a river called the Hudson. Clearly the only out option of, he had. The only <laughs> option he had. I know. And it was clearly out of the box thinking, going, okay, we're in the Hudson. Okay. Yep. You know, and you know, in the movie the first thing he's worried about is did we get everybody off board did we do we have all 155 people and remember that they're they're going to different the sides of the river they're going to different sides of the river and he didn't know you know that is until, mark you as you well know that would be the aircraft commander's first concern or the captain's yeah. biggest concern did i get everybody off the jet yeah is everybody off the jet and remember he actually went down the aisle to see if everybody's out of the jet wading the cold, through the water. The cold water of the Hudson up to his knees. And it, I think it was in like January too, wasn't it? Uh -huh. So, uh, I mean, it's really cold, okay? It's yep. cold outside and it's really cold in the water and he's got it in the airplane. And and like any good commander of an aircraft, okay, is everybody off this airplane? I'm going to okay. walk to the back. I'm going to get wet. I'm going to walk to the back. It's going to be cold, but I got to make sure everybody's off. But, but back tying that back to our three maxims mm -hmm. of flying. Aviate first, they landed the airplane in the yeah. Hudson. Navigate, yeah. they found the Hudson. Yeah. Three, he made very few radio calls to New York departure or yeah. approach or whomever. When yeah. he told them he wasn't going to Teterboro because he couldn't make the runway, he said, we're going in the Hudson. That's all he said. He was yeah. focused on flying that airplane to save the people. Yeah that he was charged with as yeah. passengers. And the other thing about his background too, is he's been a glider pilot and then understood, you know, L over D max. Right guy, you know? right yeah. place, right, right time. time. Great performance as a yeah. team with his FO yeah. and cabin yeah. crew and cabin crew yeah. on the evac. So yeah. right crew, right day, right time, positive outcome. Yeah. Hey, you just mentioned something too. Talk to us about, how integral the guys and gals in the back of the airplane, the flight attendants are in what you guys do. Well, and how they Mark, fit into that three things. Okay. Mark, as you well know, it's one team, one fight. Mm -hmm. Okay. Meaning everybody has information. Everybody needs to share information and you have to work as a team. Whether you're the aircraft commander of a KC-135 with two pilots, two navs, one boomer, one load, you know, whatever, uh, MEGP folks, or different paradigm, you're the captain, first officer, flight attendant of a civilian airliner. In an emergency, well, day to day, you work as a team anyways, but in an emergency situation, you work as a team at a higher level. Everybody has to share information because somebody may know something that I on the flight deck don't know. Somebody may see something, a panel, uh, smoke, leaking fluid that I can't see or hear something, that sounds weird. So if they share that information, you know, we call it, you know, it, 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 it is tr truly a team, Mark, and I can't emphasize that enough. Um, airline crews in the civilian world that don't act as a team, the outcome will not be as good as if we act. And that's how we train. We train in our annual simulator training, we work together 
we, we actually have a crew brief before each flight. Hi, I'm Tom. Flying time is going to be two hours and 43 minutes. Turbulence, not a factor. Weather's good where we're going. If there's anything we can do for you, please let us know. Set the tone. Just like just like you're taught in you know, crew resource management, yeah. Mark, set the tone. Yeah. And buying cookies and coffee helps. <laughs> but 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 no, but but all, all, all joking aside, it's integral that everybody work together. Six people have to work together for a positive outcome. Normal flight, not normal flight. Good weather, not so good weather. Going to a big airport, little airport. Doesn't matter. There be there is information that people have that if we share together, all six of us have a positive outcome. And and so many people, I'm sorry to say, think, okay, well, you're here to serve me in the back of the airplane, you know, food and drinks and stuff like that. And don't realize the training that even the flight attendants in the back go through. And some of these flight attendants, guys and gals, have been doing it for a very long time. They are there for your safety as the flying public. Yes, they are there also for certain hospitality features, yeah. but when 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 you land and need to evac the airplane they will direct you to the exits they know where the flashlights are if it's dark once the airplane's evacuated they're going to uh detail two able body assistants but at the end of the day like you talked about captain sullenberger the captain is responsible yeah. for everybody on that airplane and you know but once again you've got six to you know International wide body flight, you could have 12 flight attendants yeah. and four pilots. So now you got 16 people working together. So, but you know, as, as you scale up or down, the communication still is the same. You and I can have a chat to people. You add two more people this podcast. We communicate differently, but we mm -hmm. communicate the same. If you brought Blender and Drifter and Don into this podcast, they'd all be shooting their watch, yeah. but we still be communicating. Yeah. You and I, as a couple airlifters, be going yeah yeah but 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 anyways, no, all, all kidding aside it's, it's all about communication how you set the tone yeah. and 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 how you start the day off and how you end the day we do a debrief now at the end of the flight how did that go yeah. could yeah. we have done anything better? better not only between the two pilots but with the with the, the cabin crew yeah lessons and you used learned to, lessons and learned Lessons learned from the cockpit, uh, yeah. or flight deck, as we call it now. But Mark, yeah. you did the same thing after a tanker mission. Yeah, we did. You, you'd go back to the squadron or back to the VFW or wherever yeah. one conducted yeah. debrief, yeah. and you'd have that same discussion. So you offloaded twenty thousand k versus twenty five thousand k. How'd that go? Or you know when that when that uh, four ship of Vipers pulled into the pre contact position, number two was a little out of place. How did you adapt? You know, as Clint Eastwood would say, adapt, improvise, overcome. Yeah. Feeds yeah. right back into aviate, okay. navigate, navigate and communicate. Okay. Doesn't it? So, but but no, truly, you start with a tone, you end with a debrief, everything goes better. Yeah. You know what, TC, I just thought of a classic, probably one of the best cases of how the cabin crew in the back saved everybody on the plane. And that was that recent uh, Japan incident where the uh, wide body landed on the, on the de Havilland. A they got yeah, the one everybody in out. Everybody. We're talking about one, yeah. The A350. Yeah. Yeah. They got, but, uh, I think it was all the pond 314 or something like that. Mm -hmm. Anyway, yeah. that Jow. airplane. J -L. That, yeah. Was it JL? The cabin crew got everybody out of that airplane on fire. So do you know, everybody lived. That according to the FAA, a cabin evac has to happen within 90 seconds. Everybody has to get off the airplane within 90 seconds. That's how the airplane is certified in the cabin. I didn't yes. know that. That's how the airplane is certified. Now, mm -hmm. you are entirely correct, Mr. Sluggo. That crew of that JAL A350 did a phenomenal, phenomenal job. They got everybody off safely. Yeah, everybody might have had a little bump, scratch, bruise. However, comma, that is going to be a bellwether of how to do a cabin evacuation going forward. So we're going to learn from that, yeah. not only with a composite fuselage and how it burns, yeah. to how that cabin crew performed and how they integrated with the flight deck. The flight yeah. deck would call the evacuation 
Yeah. If they're not, if they're not able to, then the flight attendants will call for the evacuation. But let's say they all worked as a team. Yeah. And that was a domestic flight, high density domestic 787. Yeah. They worked as an amazing team. So let's go back to aviate, navigate, communicate. The flight attendants do that too. They communicate to the flight deck what they see, what's going on, what do we need, and how can we do this? And it's incumbent upon the people on the flight deck to work as a team. Because as you well know, there's no I in team. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that cabin crew did enough. Uh, I mean, just incredible. Okay. Amazing. I mean, the airplane's on fire. The, one of the engines is still spinning, and they got everybody off and everybody's alive. I mean, Agreed. that was amazing, particularly after a runway incursion and they landed on the Coast Guard. Uh, it's a Japanese Coast Guard to Havlin. The, so, uh, as, as we eight. all talk about, Mark, and you've heard this before, the causal factors communication, yeah. night, lighting. Yeah. Fusion. We'll we'll wait for the Japanese authorities to come out with that report, just like we all wait for the NTSB to come out with any report. Yeah. We, you know, we don't play Monday morning quarterback. Mm -hmm. We listen, we yeah. learn, and as Tony will tell you, you move on with the lessons you learn yeah. in redefining airmanship. I, <laughs> this is a great book. No, I I am not a salesman for Tony Kern, yeah. but this is an amazing book. Should be read by every private pilot to ATP from mm -hmm. co-pilot. Examiner pilot in the Air Force, Navy, Marine Corps, Coast Guard, CBP. Doesn't matter what you do, corporate pilot. Yeah. All right. So let's get into your helmet bag of tricks, man. What's your next lesson learned? We've talked lessons about lessons learned. We talked about aviate, navigate, communicate. What else? Don't do a low level flyby at Parks College <laughs> in a C9 with the former chief of Max Stanaval in the audience. Okay. You got to tell what happened. That's a lesson learned. Well, you know, uh, in my formative years in the mighty C9, <laughs> we were tasked with doing a flyby at the Parks College grass strip on the east side of the Mississippi in Illinois. All the squadron director of operations said was, quote, don't get violated, end quote. <laughs> Famous last words. Okay. Yes, yes. What does Mac you know, Mac, right, Air Force Reg 6016, all those things that are instructions now. Yeah. So lesson learned is when you're a C-9 crew member, co-pilot, no people on board. This was an empty airplane trainer. Mm -hmm. We were down a little rock doing some transition work, coming back up to Mississippi, yeah. cleared in hot by the air boss, coming across show center about 100 feet off the deck, doing about 320 indicated, which is fast for a C-9, yeah. slow for an F-15. Yeah. At an air show, so legal air show airspace, yeah. according to the FAA. So surface to whatever, 5,000 mm -hmm. feet, zero to VMO, MMO. Yeah. But it was not well received. So <laughs> there were three passes done. One clean pass with the gear up, one configured pass with the gear down like a missed approach, and the third pass that I did. So the clean pass was done by my dear friend, Bill Stevens, who came across show center about a hundred feet smoke and pulls up into a Shondell left downwind. And I then fly the, the configured pass as a missed approach, mm -hmm. totally legal. Craig fly, my, my dear friend, Craig O'Mara flies the third pass. We go back to Scott air force base on a Sunday afternoon. We finish up our drill weekend. And then Monday morning, the director of operations calls all three of us and goes, Hey, did you guys do a flyby at parks? And we all go, you told us to. Yeah, remember right. you told us to. Right, you asked us to. Okay, it was part mm -hmm. of our flight plan. We filed a delay yeah. at Little Rock, then we filed a delay at Parks. Yeah, at Parks. Yeah. yeah. So Monday morning, we're like, uh, "Yes, you asked us to. Yes, we did it. Did you guys really fly a clean pass a hundred feet off the deck?" And to which I said, "I have no knowledge of such pass." However, Bill Stevens goes, "Yeah, that was me. Bill used to fly F one hundred sixes in the guard." So he was used to going fast and low. Craig O'Mara had signed for the jet as the aircraft commander, mm -hmm. actually instructor pilot, evaluator pilot. Yeah. So Craig is now going, oh, there go my wings. Shall I just retire now? Quit now? And luckily the outcome was nobody got in trouble. Our squadron chief pilot 
made good, made made happy with the chief, former chief of state of Al, retired colonel, yeah. who happened to call the current chief of state of Al, said, I saw one of your airplanes, blah, blah, blah. And there was photographic evidence, Mark. Of so course. Craig, Bill, and I each have a photograph of the C-9 doing a clean pass at Parks College about uh, 50 feet off the deck, smoking down the runway. And see, so the lesson I learned is, if you're a C-9 co-pilot or aircraft commander, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> That's that discretion being the better part of valor thing. But you learn. Okay, so you learn. You learn that fast forward 25 plus years, uh, and I'm not going to do that anymore. But see... That's totally in the comfort zone of a 106 guy, isn't it? Eagle guy, viper guy, rhino guy, yeah. blood guy, They're all used guy. To that. Yeah, take your pick. It, 102, 104, 105, 106. He didn't hey, think anything of it. He didn't think let, anything of it. I'm like, let's come, let's come to the break. Break yeah. it 300. Pull into the, you know, do a Mr. Pro, you know, do a yeah. uh, option. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. To the pattern. Yeah. yeah. Bill thought nothing of dropping down to 50 feet above the grass strip and come and show center to show the taxpayers what their money was paying for that day. And it was a beautiful thing, Mark. We still laugh about it. We and still... only one guy didn't like it. <laughs> you know, those crusty 06 Max Stanaval guys, they got yeah. no sense of humor, brother. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. So, okay, on to the next yeah. one. Got one more for us? Wow. He asked me about three lessons from the from the cockpit. Yeah. We talked about what are the maximums of flying, aviate, yeah. navigate, communicate. We talked about building relationships and yeah. nurturing them, okay, yeah. over a career. See, we talked about what not to do in a C9. Yeah, yeah. I'll finish it up with be a student of what you do. Oh, learn. Great keep, keep learning. Great. Even middle-aged dogs can learn new tricks. I am living proof that middle-aged dogs can learn new tricks b read and read feeds into learn mm -hmm. keep reading read stuff that comes out currently or go back and learn about guys who flew the hump in the burma china theater <laughs> who flew c-54 full of coal to berlin in the berlin airlift with tunner and and guys like that learn who people like eddie rickenbacker frank borman Tunner, Doolittle, Tibbets, Gail Kenny, Halverson, yeah. Gail Halverson, the candy bomber who's yeah. got a C 17 named after him. Yep. I was there when they did it. Oh, I know you were. Yeah, and, I was and, there when you they made, did. and you made a wall pilot graphic of it. I did. I that sure you did. You gave to General Minahan. Yeah, I did. With I a C 54 candy bomber. Yeah. But, but, yeah. but, but that feeds back to be a student of history. Yeah. Be a student of your craft, and you will have a wonderful career. Mm -hmm. That's one takeaway I think is important for anybody. Doctor, lawyer, pilot, software coder, you know, whatever. Learn about Grace Hopper. Oh, yeah. Admiral Rickover. Yeah. For my Navy friends. For my Navy yeah. friends. Read Dick Marchenko's book. Yeah. Learn about the plank owners at SEAL Team 1 and SEAL Team 2, but back to our neighborhood, Mark. Yeah. Wilbur and Orville. Yeah. Ben Fulwa. Mm -hmm. Raul Lufberry. Eddie oh, Rickenbacker. Yeah. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Gabby Gabreski. Robin Olds. The Wolf Pack. Yeah. Still alive with the triple nickel over at Aviano. Absolutely. And the Mighty Eighth. Okay. Absolutely. These are just not names. These are guys that paved the road that we all drive on. And he who fails to learn the lessons of history are doomed to repeat it. Yeah. The guys yeah. that planned Overlord, Neptune, Linebacker 1, Linebacker 2, OEF, OIF, including yours truly, Sluggo, in the tanker <laughs> cell, with Buzz Mosley running the chaos. Okay? Oh, what a great commander. Mark Welsh, okay? Yeah. Fingers, Goldfein. Yeah. Okay? And, and modern day, CQ Brown, now yeah. the chairman of the JCS wearing a blue suit. But these are names that if you learn about in the airline business, Eddie Rickenbacker, Charlie Lindbergh, Juan Treep, Pan Am, yeah. 
Yeah. You Frank learned Barman. that lesson. Frank Barman. Frank, who was a CEO of Eastern Airlines after yeah. going around the moon in Apollo 8. But yeah. these are, you know, you learn and that becomes a fabric of what you do and what you know and who you talk to and what you mm -hmm. share and what they share with you. I had the amazing opportunity to fly with a guy last week, captain at Alaska Airlines, whose dad was a 747 captain for Northwest Airlines, who had flown for North Central before that, which became part of the Northwest. Ama think about what he saw in his career, oh, yeah. what I've seen in my career, yeah. and what my dear friend Stephanie Hand will see in her career flying tankers out of Milden Hall for the bloody 100th. Yeah. Okay? So that that's the that's the spectrum of what we've seen over the past now over a hundred years of powered flight. What's the next hundred years going to be? UAVs, UASs, going to go to the moon, going to go to Mars, going to have supersonic transport between New York and Tokyo in two and a half hours. Well, I don't know. <laughs> there you go. And the crazy thing is, TC people are working on that. Sure, you got boom, and you got. Uh, SpaceX, kind of stuff. Yeah. And you got Blue Origin, and you've yeah. got you've got you know really smart people thinking about 10, 15, 20 years from now. Will we will we fly carbon fuel airplanes or will be the electric or hydrogen powered? Blended yeah. wing, blended wing transports or blended wing um you know airliners. I'm surprised that nobody's built a Okay, they built a B-2 and now a B-21. However, I'm surprised that nobody's built a blended wing transport. Yeah. Like a, a huge bat wing transport to fly cargo between East Coast and West Coast and mm -hmm. Europe and Asia. I really surprised that Boeing, yeah. I know NASA's done some demonstrator work, but I'm surprised that nobody's built a 747 size blended wing transport. I really yeah. haven't. No. Is that the next iteration? Quiet electric engines, hydrogen powered, elect, you know, whatever, solar powered, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, the MIT Project Condor guys flew across the English Channel in a solar power airplane, the yeah. Gossamer Condor, you know, that was 40 years ago. What What's that next iterative step? Yeah. You and I will be sitting in rocking chairs on our front porch <laughs> watching the car. Yeah. But, I mean, just think of the 30 years that you and I have been flying there, how everything has changed. You know, engine technology, flight tech technology, communications technology, so many things has TPDLC, changed. TPDLC, okay? Uh, yeah. I don't have, I can fly across the Pacific and not talk to a controller between the mainland of the U.S. and Hawaii. It's all on a, a, a flight management computer via a computer pilot data link. Uh, you and I used to have to do position reports. Position reports are a thing of the past, Mark. I know, isn't that crazy? You know, here we are at this point with this much fuel at this time, and we're looking at this one. Next. But think about the guys who did it in a Connie or a DC-3 or a Neptune or a Privateer oh, or gosh. a PBY between San Francisco and Hawaii, flying yeah. the null, the dits and the dats and the dash, dashes. Oh, yeah, it's crazy, you know? Yeah. And, and, you know, that's one airplane I would love to get inside of is a PBY Catalina. I used to see him down in LA with, as a kid all the time because there was a lot of people that were flying him still. I want to see a Herc on floats. I want to see a Herc on floats. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know floats. about that one, brother. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <clears throat> Those are from my Assock buddies. I just throw yeah. it out there. Pineapple. Um, during this whole time we've been talking, I kept thinking about uh, something you and I were discussing just before we went to record here tell the story of urban drew and how you know him and what he what kind of guy he was well let me right? start with saying for all you masters of the air fans on apple tv now you're going to hear a real story of yeah. a real warrior oh, not yeah. that the bloody 100th guys weren't going downtown berlin or bremen or Wilhelmshaven in their b-17s but they had to have little friends to go along with them Long time ago, 1995 to be exact, I bought a painting of a guy walking out to his P-51 that hangs in my office. I'm gonna I'm gonna pan my camera, Mark, mm -hmm. and show your yeah. audience a magnificent oil painting yeah. by Les Carter of Ben Drew walking out to his airplane at Boston. Yeah. Yeah. Ben Ben was a Detroit kid, Air Corps pilot, 
graduate of uh, Army Air Corps training, came back as a P-51 instructor, and they then flew for the 375 Squadron of the 361 Fighter Group, Badasham 1944, flying this. The Detroit Miss. The Detroit Miss. That'd be Echo 2 Delta underscore. That's his personal airplane. Detroit Miss, because he's from Detroit. Seven swastikas on the railing. Okay? Can't be real. Man. He was an ace. Over five, you're an eight. Five or over, you're an yeah. ace. But on a wonderful day in October of 1944, Ben was the first Allied airman to shoot down two ME-262s over Akmar, Germany. First two ME-262s. Yeah. Galan's Pride Squadron, Commando Novotny. Okay? Yeah. JV-44. So I met Ben through the painting. Got to know him later in life. Was fortunate enough to sit with him and listen to his stories. And huh. what an amazing guy. Mustang driver, P-47 driver off Iwo Jima, flew DC-3s and DC-6s and 7s in the U.S., started two airlines in Europe and Africa, flew Goonie Birds up and down the Transvaal to parts of Africa that I've, I've never been to. Um, later in life was an aircraft broker. But also later in life, well into his 80s, he uh, was an amazing part of the air show circuit. He would be at shows with artwork and signing autographs. And having the painting, I didn't know the story behind the painting. I had to go through my dear friend, Boom Powell, who wrote a book about Ben called The Cats and Jam Race and learn more of the story. Once I peeled back the onion and met the guy, I mean, I was in awe. So fast forward to a very cold December morning in 2013. We buried Ben at Arlington National Cemetery with full military honors because he was awarded an Air Force Cross in 1983 in lieu of a 1944 DFC for shooting down the two 262s. I did not with, know that. With full honors, caisson, platoon, band, yeah. riderless horse with boots backwards in the stirrups, yeah. and a Mustang flyby with this very bottle in the back seat of a P-51. We honored an old warrior by burying him at Arlington National Cemetery in Section 50. What does it say on the bottle? What's the inscription on the bottle? Mark, you got pretty good eyes for an old guy. It says, Lieutenant Ben Drew, 10-9-2013, Arlington flyover, P-51, Detroit miss, by the pilot of the P-51, who did it, Andy McKenna. Huh. And we drank this bottle at the 30th reunion of my pilot training class. Everybody had a drink, and we made a toast Remember. to a member of the greatest generation. Yeah. You know, it's amazing. People are really learning a lot about what those guys went through, okay? Because, as you know, they just did the schweinfurt Regensburg grades, and those were disastrous. Bloody Thursday. Yeah, bloody Thursday. There's something in there that I'm really glad that they put in, though. The donut gal. Yeah. Do you know the, the story behind the donut gal? That's, a little bit. Yeah. That's Catherine Spots. It's Dewey Carl's Spots's daughter. Yeah. 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 Uh, she's portrayed by that English uh, actress. Okay. Now, she wasn't with the Bloody 100th, I found out, but she was one of those gals that got up at 4 30 in the morning and made donuts and coffee for these guys when they went out on their missions and when they got back. And, Mark, just for your audience, the Bloody 100th is still flying the Square D at yeah. Mildenhall in the mighty yeah. KC 135R model. They sure are. With with the 492, the 493, and the 494, their neighbors over Lake and Heath, the Bolars. Yeah. And and they're now F-35s. Yeah. Um, I did a special uh, wall pilot deal for them. They asked me, we want something that we can put in the front of our squadron so when everybody walks in, they know we're a tanker squadron. And they put the nose arc from their B-17s on their 15 KC-135s, 12 KC-135s. Cool. And so they had me draw up the nose art. And so when you walk in, you have the airplane and it's a head-on view and underneath the wings, it's got every piece of nose art from the bloody 100th on the uh, represented underneath the wings on both sides. Well, Mark, one thing that your audience yeah. need, needs to understand is, you know, you and I, both serve this great nation for many years, but yeah. the service of the greatest generation in the ETO 
in the eighth air force was nothing short of magnificent yeah going downtown in an unpressurized b-17 either with little friends or not all the way to berlin all the way to regensburg regensburg and schweinfurt yeah. all the way to bremen all the way to wilhelmshaven up on the north sea yeah uh the the sub pens that send us are um yeah. And then flying down to Africa after you no, go all the way to Germany, yeah. you know, it, it really is a testament to that greatest generation that Tom Hanks and Steven Spielberg have really portrayed with great authenticity yeah. and oh, a lot yeah. of emotion, a lot of emotion there. Um, you know, sadly, most of those gentlemen are gone, but yeah. their stories live. Their mm -hmm. stories live in books, in movies and with guys like you and me. And the people at the Bloody 100th at Milton Hall, they still are the torchbearers for that 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 Square D group. Yeah. And guys like, like Chad Mansky, who who was the yeah. commander of the the Bloody 100th as a tanker uh, wing, and 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 today's current you know leadership at Milton Hall, or at the yeah. Young Tigers at Kadena, or at the Triple Nickel at Aviano. Yeah. You know these legacy squadrons have a story to tell, and I'm I'm really glad that that uh, masters of the air is telling that story for, yeah. for a wider audience. Yeah. And I understand that the uh, air fueling wing got a special privilege to see a couple of the episodes before they were published, before they were out. Okay. As they should. <clears throat> Ryan Garlow, I think is the wing commander there. Now he's a, he's a patch wearing guy too. He went through our school and uh, for, for, for your audience, uh, he's a weapons school grad. He's a weapons school grad. Yeah. Thank you. And they got to see, I guess, some of the episodes. I don't know how many. And and he put on his Facebook page, he goes, wait till you see this, folks, because it's Mark, can you imagine incredible. being 22 years old, strapped to a Boeing B-17 with your sheepskin coat on, 50 Mission Crush cap and a pair of headphones, flying all the way from Thorpe's Abbott to Berlin and back yeah. and living and living to tell about it or not? And living through 25 missions, yeah. Or not. Or not. How many thousand crew members did the Mighty Eighth lose? Well, they lost, uh, what was it, 600 guys in one raid. Right. You know How many thousands yeah. of... Yeah, yeah, they weren't all killed. Some of them became POW. Some of them actually made it, which is portrayed in the movie. You know, some of the guys made it out. And you always hear in the movie, they always say, you know, there's a parachute, there's a parachute, there's a parachute. Everybody's counting. Okay, how many guys got out? Some guys didn't. I like how it portrays the history of all this too, because right after the Regensburg raid and everything, they're like going, we can't go downtown daylight anymore. Without, so without Mustangs and Jugs. But, yeah. And the Mustangs were just showing up. The Mustangs were just showing up at the end of 43. Exactly. And, and they were a models. They were a model Razorbacks first. Yeah. This is a D model with the bubble canopy yeah. for your audience. Uh, the D model has a, either a Rolls Royce Merlin or Allison or Packard supercharged motor. That's why it could fly at yeah. 30,000 feet or 25,000 feet and fight the Fock Wolves and Messerschitz all the way to the target, all, all the way home. Yeah. The, because the, what? It had drop tanks. Yeah. Because we didn't have aero refueling in World War II, no. Mark, right? Right. You had to have drop tanks. You'd toss the drop tanks if you went into a dogfight yeah. with, uh, with the Luftwaffe, but you could go all the way from, you'd meet up over the channel just like in the in, in masters yeah. of the air you yeah. meet your strike package you know over the channel take them all the way downtown berlin and all the way home or cologne yeah. or bremen yeah. or take your pick you know where, wherever they were going and ben led 50 mustangs with the bombers all the way to germany and back and he lived to tell about it yeah which is amazing age 24 age 20 how many That's 24 how was how how many twenty four year olds do you know lead fifty mis fifty mission fifty airplane Mustang packages with two or three or four bomber groups all the way to Germany strike and then come back at twenty four amazing enough yeah. there are tanker drivers at, at that age there there yeah. are Eagle or Lightning drivers at that age but an integrated force package of that kind of complexity mm -hmm. at, at that age yeah. in the in the 1944 technology world it's truly amazing i my hats my yeah. my hat is off I, I you know meeting ben and knowing ben adds something to the story yeah and believe it or not his wings my wings your wings same design oh i mean you know i'm now yours yours has a star and a 
toilet seat over it. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. Mine does too. But, you know, that wing design goes back to World War I. And the Air Force luckily hasn't changed it yet. Yeah, they have not. And that's, and that's that legacy I was talking about. Whether it's the Wright brothers, Ben Fulwa, yeah. Rickenbacker, Robin Olds, Wolfpack, Root Pack 6, MIG Alley, yeah. you know, all those tanker orbits you set up yeah. over, the, over the Med and over uh, the Persian Gulf. Noble Anvil, I, you know, um, Noble Eagle, doesn't matter. That, that, there's, a, there's a continual thread that you pull and you will learn some very interesting yeah. stories. You will learn about Enola Gay and Boxcar, Tibbetts and Sweeney. And the things that they had to do to pull that off. Joe Jabara. Joe Jabara, the first Jet Ace. Yeah. Steve Ritchie and Chuck the Bellevue and Jeff Feinstein of the Triple Nickel and 338, mm-hmm. respectively. And and guys like Rico. Oh, yeah. God I've love him. Got in Tucson. Yeah. Driving his Eagle. An amazing killed. guy. Amazing guy. Amazing American. Okay. And one of the humblest guys you'll ever meet. But you but know? but that that's that continuum. Yeah. To the modern day. I mean, there's there's kids, and I hate to use the term, out driving eagles and vipers and hogs and mud hens and, you know, uh, lightnings and raptors, tankers, mooses. They're doing the same thing, but a, 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 in a different era. And they're doing it at 24 years old. And hornets and, yeah. you know, whatever else, you know, helicopters and yeah. UAVs, God forbid. Uh- <laughs> you know what? The average age of the folks on the flight deck that are launching planes and slinging bombs and fueling the jets and everything like that is 19 years old. So, so the guys that D- Dale Brown calls BB stackers, bomb loaders, yeah, tanker toads, yeah. sack weenies. Yeah. Those guys there. Yeah. I mean, it's an amazing Testament to people that write, raise their right hand and say, I state your name yeah, and go yeah. into harm's way. Yeah. And there's no date stamp on that beginning or ending it's an empty check mark you know that yeah it really is you know and it, the p-51 that you've got there beside you too i mean that really was the f-22 raptor of its day when you think about this all was a game changer this was, was a game changer now pe- people say that the jug was a stouter bird better for you know low altitude cast mm-hmm. but in the day this was a, actually the a model was a british design designed for the brits Yep. When she got to the D model with the supercharged Merlin, game changer. Mm-hmm. 650 caliber uh, mm-hmm. weapons yep. integrated in the wing. And, you know, the fact that I actually got to sit down with a no kidding Mustang ace, have a cup of coffee, he yeah. signed my book. I got the painting. We put him in the ground at Arlington. It's a great story. Yeah. And it's a story that, that doesn't end with Ben because you and I, all our friends, we're all retired. But yeah. there's another generation out there serving this great nation. Yeah. And whether they're on a carrier in the Med or carrier in the Red Sea or, you know, they're a Raptor wing or a Eagle wing or tanker group or flying for the Corps, so there's another chapter to be written, Mark. Yeah, really is. Really is. I got to sit. I was at uh, Squadron Officer School and spent two hours on the phone with Robin Olds. And I learned more about leadership and combat in those two hours than probably any other seminar I've ever been in. You got his book there behind you. Great oh book God. signed by Christina Olds. Is Great it? book. You're a fighter pilot. You need to read this book. Yeah. Bolo. Yeah. yeah. Linebacker one, linebacker two. Fighter sweeps up route pack six. Yeah. Great book. So I've got uh, Robin over here on the corner over here. I've got uh, Adolf Galland's signature on a picture of him over here on the other side. And if you haven't read his book, The First and the Last by Adolf Galland, that is probably one of the best books you'll read from an enemy commander that you'll ever. Oh, another incredible guy, Gunther Rohl. Signed book. Yeah, he lived to a good old age, too. He did. And he helped uh, helped create the modern day Luftwaffe. Yeah. Yeah. Post war, when we all became friends. Yeah. He helped uh, design and lead the, the modern-day Luftwaffe. And, and an amazing story. Yeah, the Galans, the Mackie Steinoffs, the Gunther Rals, the yeah. uh, Eric Hartmanns yeah. of the world. You know, on the other side of the fence, from the yeah. Olds and the Gabby Gabreskis and the Hub Zemkis 
and the yeah. Don Gentiles, the George Bushes of the world, 41, yeah. driving his torpedo plane off the San Jacinto. Yeah. Do you have Mitsuo Fujita's book on Midway? I do not. Oh, brother. <laughs> That's, Mark, we could we could do this all day long. That's, Have you read? Yeah. That's the other book that I think everybody needs to read because it's the Pacific Commander, enemy commander's view. And he's got his last chapter is his lessons learned. Okay. And everything. It's amazing. Okay. What, is, what did Yamamoto say? We have awoken, awoken a, sleeping, a sleeping dragon. Giant. giant that's right. Giant. He awoken yeah. and filled him with a terrible resolve. And but Isoroko Yamamoto was a naval attaché in Washington in the 30s. Yeah. He knew about the vast industrial might of this nation once it was yeah. awakened. So there's a lesson learned for modern day leadership, folks. He who fails to learn the lessons of history are doomed to, to repeat it. it. So when indo pacom gets a little spicy, I mean, yes, we have a land war going on in Eastern Europe, which I never thought I'd see in my lifetime. Yeah. But once... You know, somebody comes across the former ice and straight, fights on. Yeah. I'll tell you something about Mitsuo Fujita. He left Hiroshima the day before they dropped the bomb. He got called to Tokyo for a commander's conference. He was at Hiroshima the day before Paul Tibbetts dropped the bomb on it. That'd be called good timing. And then he was the head of the team to investigate what happened. And he's the only guy on that team that didn't die from radiation sickness and poison, yeah. the only one, okay? And he became a very good friend of one of the gunners from the Tokyo uh, Dulu raid. They became fast friends and he became a Christian missionary. You know, he goes, okay, well now I know why I'm still alive. Well, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring it all full circle for you, Mark, wearing my Dedalian shirt, talking about the Doolittle Raiders. Yeah. I had, I had the great fortune many years ago to have lunch with the plane captain from number six, Bill Bowers, mm -hmm. belonged to my Dedalian flight here in Denver. And to sit and have lunch with a no kidding do a little raider. What an honor, really. So what did you learn from that? What did he, uh, I mean, what did he talk Mo about? The most humble, self-effacing guy you ever want to meet. He stuck around and made it all the way to 06. And all this stuff uh, got donated to Andy Parks Museum here in uh, Denver called Vintage Aero Flying Museum. Yeah. But Bill Bowers, think about it, Hornet, April 1942. Can yeah. we do this? Should we do this? Bull Halsey turns the Hornet into the wind. Jimmy Doolittle takes airplane number one off yeah. the flat top. Nobody knows if he's going to make it. They all circle above and wait for everybody to get off the boat. Warm up. And they, and they yeah, and they, you know, they, they end up going downtown Tokyo. The, lesson, the lessons from the cockpit from that, Mark, are this country is filled with amazing people who are willing to, in a time of war, stand up and be counted. Yeah. Just like you, just like John Connors, just like yeah. Bill Bowers, just like Robin Olds, and yes, even me. So she, that, and, and to think about how they did that, how they pulled that off, you know, I mean, we've got these amazing cockpits that allow us to navigate all over the world, you know, and they're doing like clock to map the ground. I mean, needle know. ball airspeed needle yeah. with a whiz wheel. Needle, with a whiz wheel. Navigator yeah. literally is needle ball airspeed. Yeah. I, I, I told my son one day, I said, yeah, yeah, man, we went to the moon, you know, on a slide roll. And my oldest son looked at me and goes, dad, I have no idea what you're talking about. Hey, What's Mark, slide where's roll? your whiz wheel? I know you got a whiz wheel somewhere in the office. Come on, pull it out of the closet. I don't have a whiz wheel. I've got a plot. I've got the old plotter, though. I've okay. got my plotter back there. Okay. All right. But yeah, slide roll. Okay. That was the calculator of the day. Okay. And we used to do our uh, weight and balance in the tanker with a slide roll. The booms had a slide roll. So All one right. piece of data that did not evade cranium is 68650 which is the empty weight of a c9 alpha with jt8d-9a flat rated 14 <laughs> five to <three> level. <laughs> beat into my head as a young lieutenant yeah I'll at an bet. early age yes i'll bet but well brother we've been talking for an hour and 45 minutes man well i hope i didn't Good i hope i didn't break your camera mark no uh, uh this has been great man this has really been good 
Hey, I, um, I just want to say this is this is this is fun for me. I, I, great to be on lessons from the cockpit. Yeah. Wish you a lot of success because what you're doing is important. It's part of that educational process. It's about learning where we came from, where we're going, but also where we've been. And each of us has a story. And that's what I say in my opening, increasing critical thinking skills, both in the air and on the ground. That's why I do this. And to get these well, stories out because everybody's learning from them. As you heard me say on June 3rd of 2023, Mark, I pointed to Lexington and Concord, 20 yeah. nautical miles to the north yeah. of Boston, Massachusetts. And I said, and I quote, that John, my dear friend, God rest his soul, is the logical extension of that minute man yeah. who grabbed his musket on April 19th of 1775. Yeah. And the truth? it is, it is. And, and, you know, that's not some altruistic pie in the sky theory. It's a, it's the truth. This nation was founded on men and women who are willing to do that. Yeah. And we all know who have given their full measure of devotion. That was one thing, TC, that I love about the John Adams series that was, I think, on HBO or whatever, was the portrayal of Abigail Adams. We all think about the founding fathers, okay? But what about the founding mothers and the women that go through all of this, okay? The the women, and, and I've had a number of people ask me, okay, well, you know, what's it like flying with a with a gal? It's like flying with any other pilot, okay? It's There's no difference, all right? The jet does not know the gender of the operator. No, it doesn't know the gender of the person sitting in the seat that's flying the jet, flying the aircraft, okay? And and I've often wondered, I hope someday somebody will write a book like Ambrose did. Mark, I'm women. glad you said that. Look, great book, Valiant Women. Lena Andrews just read it. It is a library book, okay? Okay. Fabulous story of the wax and the waves in World War II. Okay. Fabulous. This is a good book. I highly recommend it for your audience. Yeah. Just finished reading it. Um, it tells that very same story. It is Band of Brothers. It is yeah. the Pacific. But it is about the brave women who yeah. served this nation in World War II in the wax and the waves and the Marine Corps and the Coast Guard. And think about the things that they did, you know, the, the wasps and everything. Delivering the airplanes. I mean, you had gals that were had multi, multi certifications in aircraft. Another great book. Her. Another great book. Who's it by? Erin Miller, Final Flight, Final Fight. Her grandmother was a wasp. Uh -huh. Couldn't be buried at Arlington. She got the legislation changed. And her grandmother is now sitting in hallowed ground uh, by the Potomac. Good. Great book. And Good. Aaron, Aaron is a phenomenal American. She changed the world. I saw a picture of uh, President Obama signing that legislation for the wasp and everything. I think you know, which is Don was there. Yeah, Don was, Don was there. Uh, Nicole. Aaron uh, was there. Aaron's in that picture. Oh, is she? Yep. Okay. Her grandmother was. Uh, yeah. Yeah, because those women did. I mean, incredible things delivering the airplanes all around and. And instructing, you know, and, and like you said, the, the you know seat what, of the you know airplane what, does not know the gender of the person sitting you know what, in the seat. Do you know what Paul Tibbetts did? Uh-uh. What? Okay. He found two WASP B-29 crews, brought them down to Florida, put them in a B-29. Actually, I'm sorry, um, not Florida, uh, Kansas. Uh-huh. Put them in a B-29. They went out and flew around in front of some of the 509th Composite Group aviators. Yeah. Landed the airplane, all got out of the airplanes. Think about the leadership lesson that that imparted to the yeah. rest of the 509th, whose modern day incantation is the 509th bomb wing at Nob Okay. Yeah. However, comma, yeah. by at the time, Colonel Tibbetts showing his crews that the B 29 did not care who was flying it, yeah. male or female. Yeah. That imparted a lesson to them that they later implemented off Tinian and Saipan. Little known story. Prior to 19, uh, August of 45. Prior to. Huh. I did not know that story. 
I know you're you're the much better historian at this than I. No, am. I'm not. No, 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 no. Uh, but but you know, little known use of information, but it's it's esoteric information. But we've been talking about aviating, navigating, communicating. Mm, okay. We've been talking about history, networking, and yeah. reading. And there's lessons learned. If you you can go back. Yeah. You know, Robin Olds and the Wolf Pack disguising F4s as F105s. Okay, in Bolo, doing sweeps up Route Pack Six. Mm-hmm. The North Vietnamese Air Force comes up, and guess what? They're not F-105. They're F-4s. F-4s, groom for mix. And see, that was one of the questions I asked him in squadron officer school. I said, you know, he says, well, you know, what do you want me to talk about? I said, sir, I want to know the history of the Bolo raid and the Tai Nguyen steel mill raid. And he said, Captain, you got plenty of stuff to write with and write on? I says, I got a legal pad here with two pens. And he goes, how much time you got? I said, sir, I'll, I have as much time as you're going to give me yeah. i said what are you doing he says well i'm watching the army navy football game and i says well sir who do you hope win and he goes i hope they both lose <laughs> but he went to west point i know that and he was as, a, did, as all, did his father and he was an all-american football player as a tackle at west point okay he was but you know he started off with a young captain in a bar one night going boss i think i got an idea of how we can uh smoke all these MiG-21s that are coming, okay? And that gentleman's name was John Beauregard Stone, John B. Stone, who is still alive down in Florida. I'm a river rat, so I've got the directory to where all these guys are. I'm oh. going to start having them on. Yeah, so you mentioned that, Sluggo, stand by. Yeah. Oh, yeah, the river rat coin. Awesome. I've got <laughs> I've got, I've got, got the patch on my, uh, one of my flight suits. For your, for your audience. The river rats originally were the Air Force air crews who went downtown yeah. Hanoi, Haiphong, over mm-hmm. over the parallel. Yeah, the Red River Valley Fighter Pilots Association is what it started as. Started by Scrappy. Yeah, yeah, and and now you know they let tanker guys, everybody else in too. Okay? Hey, Mark, you it, know they just opened foundation. up a museum. They just opened up a museum in Bowling Green, Kentucky. Know, I do know that. And it has Dan Cherry's airplane there, I believe. Okay, and, and the the docent there is a dear friend of mine, Craig Callsign Pontiff Pope. Oh, is it the Pontiff? A, the Pontiff was the driving force with Aggie Stedman and Jammer yeah. Moore and some of the other rats behind the yeah. museum. And yes, they do have General Cherry's Meg Killer. Yeah, and and folks, you know, we we're talking about this association, and of course, we talked about John Connors. And the Red River Valley Fighter Pilots Association, the River Rats, is also another great organization that uh, gives scholarships out to uh, the kids of guys that have gone down, guys and gals that are no longer with us. They do incredible work. And, of course, you can contribute. Put that in your show notes, Mark. Yeah, I'll I'll put the link in my show notes. And and you got to have a link to Dick Jonas's Nickel on the Grass. You know, I did that. I've actually done that. Aerosonic, baby. When I went to, when we took my son out of school and went to, we took Travis out of school and we homeschooled him in Europe for 80 days. And I said, there's a couple places I want to go, Normandy being the biggest one. But I wanted to go see where Patton was buried. In Luxembourg. In Luxembourg, yeah. He's buried in Luxembourg. He's got, he's, he's there all by himself in one little section. He's with his boys. He's with his boys, exactly. He's with his boys, okay. And I put a nickel in the grass, okay? And, of course, you know, people are, well, why did you do that? And there's a history behind the nickel in the grass and everything. And I'm and, not going to sing, Mark, because nobody wants to hear me. <clears throat> However, I did the same thing for Ben Drew at Arlington. Every time I'm there. Yeah, it's it's our way of honoring those that have uh, gone before us. And, and, and Pat and was incredible. An incredible commander, obviously. Yeah. And... I, my wife took a picture of me saluting his uh, cross and with the nickel on top of the cross and everything, his marker. And it, it was it was tough because the carillon bells had been playing and I had this big lump in my throat because I'm looking at the gravesite of a guy I don't think we'd ever be able to produce again. Finest you know? military tactician of his generation. Oh, yeah. Yeah, one I of mean, the most incredible do, do, guys. Do, do little, yeah. But army tactician, let's just yeah, yeah. Let's call and, you know, 
and Kinney was the tactician in the Pacific, you know, yeah. Doolittle, Doolittle was the tactician in Europe after he, after the Doolittle raid. Okay. He's the guy that uh, unleashed the Mustangs on the Luftwaffe and really got rid of them all. Okay. I mean, he's the one who really did something. So anyway, obviously mom needs help. <laughs> I see you looking over the screen. Yeah. Hey, TC, I'm going to let you go. Thanks, it's Mark. Been, thanks so much for spending two hours with me here, brother, and, and talking about all these things and people. And again. You're going to explode the internet now if you upload this podcast, you know. <laughs> well, you know what? Yours is going to be the first one we're going to do video. We're going to do audio and video because I now have a YouTube channel that we're going to put them on. All right. But I, I got to pay homage to a dear friend. Yeah. The guy who gave me this, George yeah. Nolly, another podcaster. Yeah. You know, you and George are doing great stuff. So, yeah. so thank you very much. I really i am honored to be on your show. Love yeah. to show you my models. We talk about books, <laughs> airplanes, coffee, bourbon. Um, but we and, talked and, about and, relationships. We talked about knowing your history. We talked about, obviously, okay, pilots do things. And we sometimes they're really smart. And sometimes uh, SA isn't quite there. But like you said with the C9, you had an F-106 pilot in the C. He's used to that. Some great lessons here, brother. Thanks again for being on, brother. Thanks, Mark. Well, folks, another episode of the Lessons from the Cockpit Show. Number 76 is in the can. And I really appreciate TC coming on. Like I said, he and I have been friends for a long time. And man, does he know his aviation and military history, which is why he and I get along so well, because I'm a historian too. This episode of the Lessons from the Cockpit Show was brought to you by Wall Pilot, custom aviation art for the walls of your home, office, and hangar. These are profiles of famous airplanes four six and eight feet printed on vinyl that you can peel off and stick to any flat surface exhaustively researched and incredibly detailed there's four of us that draw these things folks and we really have a great time doing that because i get my inspiration and we all get our inspiration from lessons from the cockpit show so go to wallpilot.com and order from 140 ready to print or have us do a custom print of your favorite airplane with your name, tail number, and even weapons load on it. Next week, folks, we are going to have a Vietnam A7, A4 pilot on and he's got amazing stories. And his website, folks, is a museum unto itself. So I look forward to having you on uh, next week. There's a new website for the Lessons from the Cockpit show. It's all one word, lessonsfromthecockpit.show. Now, if you go there, I have a subscription membership area under what's called the All Ranks Club. There's a free subscription, but there's also a paid for subscription. And uh, we're going to send out some swag to those people that uh, join. But the really cool thing, folks, is those that become paying members will be able to join me and others in what we call the All Ranks Bar Night, a virtual bar night that we're going to do on Zoom. So go by LessonsFromTheCockpit.show and uh, become an All Ranks member. And down in the show notes, I'll have the links to the things that uh, TC and I talked about. Thanks again, folks. I really appreciate you guys tuning in, downloading and listening to uh, my episodes. You know, I'm just an old knuckle dragon tanker pilot and I'm really, really enjoying this and we're getting lots of good comments. So look forward to talking to you again next week with uh, an A4, A7 pilot on the Lessons from the Cockpit show. 